we go. I'm recording. Okay, here we go. Got it. All right, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I like those glasses on you. Thank you. Those, those are pretty snazzy that you have on too. What can well, we say? Well, you know, I've had these for so long. It's like I keep getting the lenses changed out on them. It's like when you find something that works. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So were you teaching a class? I did. I, a group came in from Columbus. They're headquartered in Columbus, but they um, came to Cleveland for a four-week session. They had never done this before, a healthcare group. So they asked me... Um, during those sessions to do some cooking demos. So I did. Oh, cool. And today um, was their largest turnout. Today was their last uh, group. And they ran over a little. So I said, well, don't, no, no problem. We'll, we're going to make it work. So mm -hmm. that's why I had to shift you back, you know, half an hour. And I'm so sorry about that. Oh, no worries. No worries. I'm just, look, I, I sit in awe watching you work and weave through the world. You've been at this for a long time. I like that. Well, <laughs> we do the world. I guess I, that's a good term. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so we are doing this. Let me let me just kind of set this up. We are doing this both over Facebook Live, as well as and my dog got to cut up now. We're doing this over <laughs> Facebook Live, and it will also be broadcast over WOVU um, for the radio show. Okay. And so many people know you from way back because um, you are um, veil of veils on the circle, veils on 105, the red carpet, the, all of that, right? Right. And, right. and um, stenographers, before we saw Black women stenographers. Court reporting. Court I'm reporting. Court. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for correcting that. Yes, before it was, you know, before any of that, were you like the first or? I was the first, from what I can understand, um, to own a firm, um, you know, actually around the country. Mm. We had reporters that were working for the courts just before my time, but um I couldn't get hired here in Ohio, you know, when I went to uh, finish, you know, the uh, training. So I decided, so Don said, well, you know, you don't need to, you know, get a job for any, from anybody, just do your own thing, set up your own firm. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. So uh, I at first tried to get on with the courts because that would, to me at that time, but that was prestigious to be an official court reporter for the, uh, Cuyahoga County and all of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But since that didn't work out, then I just created VM Scott and Associates Court Reporters. Nice, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> and and I'm so glad you invoked your wonderful husband's name, Don Scott. Um, sometimes I don't think we um, acknowledge enough the shoulders that we stand on. So. Um, so sending up prayers and blessings to him and all that well, he is. I certainly stand on his shoulder. Yeah. And I, I just stand underneath his wings um, because without him, uh, there probably wouldn't be a Vels as we know it today. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, great. So now that I don't have my warm fuzzy. So how did you, how did you get into this healthy I mean, because because of course you're radiant. You radiate this this whole thing that you you do. I, I want to first talk about how you got into this healthy lifestyle, healthy eating. Because a lot of times people don't think of you know. Um, I I don't know if it's the you know you you were in the the. It seemed like you were in the club life, but then veils on the circle had this the food and the the all of that going on so tell me how you got into this healthy um lifestyle thing so that's a million dollar question and uh, <laughs> i have people that run into me now and tell me that come to the classes and they say so now you have fed us chicken wings through the years polish boys the best fried chicken in the world now all of a sudden you want us to eat healthy <laughs> 
I tell them, I says, well, when you know better, you do better. Right. So I'm going to get y'all now to say, all right, y'all, that wasn't quite the way it should have been. So here's the way it's going to be. But really how I got off into it, I, I have to say that um, growing up, I was born in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And my mother um, was an excellent cook. She worked for a white family of uh, doctors uh, when she was like a teenager, when she was like 17, 16 and 17 years old. And her mother let her travel with them. And mm -hmm. uh, my mother always was very particular about the food that she ate, but she became exposed to some foods that she didn't have at home and asparagus, um, fresh basil, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So when she would come home, she said she always uh, liked, liked to steam food. She never liked a lot of fried food and she liked raw food. So having that exposure, when she start, got married and had kids, then she started um, us to eat fresh food. She said, you want to eat fresh foods? We were never allowed to eat a lot of sandwiches and pop was out of the question. Right. You drink brewed iced tea or brewed lemonade or water, but you did not have soda pop and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And if you had anything sweet, it was something that she um, actually made from the garden, a peach pie, a pound cake of something like that. So saying all of that to say that we, I grew up with um, a, a, an appetite for real food. Mm -hmm. uh, coming to Cleveland, meeting the love of my life, and we ended up owning a bowling alley, um, restaurant, nightclubs, and those kind of things. I uh, got into cooking and things. And then there came a time where uh, Don um, had, a, I call it a health opportunity, not a challenge. It was an opportunity because it was a, an opportunity for me to step in and put to work what I knew. Uh, he came home one day and says that... Um, his doctor exam told him that he had hypertension. So I said, what the heck is that? A high who? He <laughs> said, well, it's a fancy word for high blood pressure. I said, oh, well, I'd heard about high blood pressure, but didn't really know what it really, what, what it was about. Mm -hmm. And he said that I have to change the way that I eat. And the other thing he said, he says, being a um, Black businessman, you're under a lot of stress and pressure that maybe other men are not under. He says, so you doubly have to make sure that um, you eat healthier. Mm -hmm. And I said, what does that mean? He says, well, he's talking about eating more uh, vegetables and maybe less fried food and relaxing more. So I, he said, but don't get any ideas. Don't get any ideas because I'm not going to eat the diet food that your mother cooks. I said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't talk about my mama, no. Now, so... <laughs> Because when we first met, he came for dinner at, at my mother's house and he said she had these little English green peas and she had spinach uh, and she had uh, boiled red skin potatoes. And he wanted to know, well, you know, where is the, you know, the pork chops and the ham hocks and what did she cook that in? I said, well, you were there, so why didn't you ask her? So he said, well, I didn't want to, you know, blow my chance of, you know, seeing you anymore by asking her what was she cooking the food in? So we laughed about it later. He says, well, I don't want that kind of food. He said, I want food that something what like my mother cooks. I said, well, she cooks with a lot of, you know, good food, ham hocks, you know, um, pork chops, um, beef and all of that. My mother does not cook that kind of food. So there's got to be something in the in between. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started doing some research, doing reading. We didn't have the internet at that time to find out what it is that a person who had hypertension, what was the best kind of diet or lifestyle for him to live. And he says, I've got an idea. So I said, well, tell me what that idea is. So he says, we should go to the motherland and see how they live. So I said, I want to make sure I understand now the motherland. He says, we should go to West Africa okay. and spend some time there. So we sat out at the kitchen table um, my daughter was away in school. Our son was about 12, 13. And we got a big map out and we looked at different places in West Africa. And we 
Alpete outlined a six week trip to West Africa so that we could go and as he said, to see how they in the motherland lived. And from that trip, I learned a lot because I saw people relaxing. I saw people eating foods that I had not seen before. I saw different herbs that I, had not, I didn't know about. Mm -hmm. I just saw a different way of life. Uh, and at that time we had um, the club that was on the circle and we were doing a beautiful Sunday dinner buffet uh, mm -hmm. that we would get people from all around the state would come on Sunday from 11 until five. Um, and we'd get two or 300 people every Sunday. Mm -hmm. So when I came back, I decided, well, here is my platform to introduce some of the things that I had learned. He says, but you can't make any radical changes because people will know it, the food will taste different and they'll stop coming. So I said, you're right. So we developed a vegetable stock. I got with my chefs and cooks and says, here's what I wanna do. We wanna keep the flavor and soul in our food, but we wanna have it lighter so that people that are diabetics and a heart failure can eat here and it will be more healthier for them. So that's exactly uh, what we did. And that launched me into the um, healthy eating um, classes. Mm -hmm. uh, different people would come in because my husband started losing weight. Uh, he looked different and they'd say, what are you doing? And he'd say, well, my wife, you know, it's got me on this really eating um, uh, platform where I'm not eating any meat. If I do eat meat, it's rarely, but it's mainly fruits and vegetables. So some of the people who came to the Sunday dinner buffet were teachers, were principals, uh, came from the Cleveland Clinic, and they wanted to know what I do workshops at their schools or at their churches. Mm -hmm. And that's when the Bell Scott's Healthy You was born. Wonderful. That, um, it, and and so, so this has been a long time. This has been over a... A it had been. Uh -huh. We started this in 2002 is okay. when I started to do that. And it has grown in leaps and bounds. It's amazing how at the time that I started, uh, I, I, I didn't see the picture that that is present now, but I just knew that it could be um, a vehicle. Mm -hmm. and having that platform, having the club, having having a, a captive audience, having two or three people on Sunday, having uh -huh. people six, seven days a week coming through our doors and we're serving food. Mm -hmm. It gave me a chance to say, well, here, try this. What do you think about this? And it was just a way of not pushing something down people's throats, but actually saying, how do you like that? How did you taste that? How mm -hmm. does it taste for you? And they said, well, this is really good. And then I would tell him, well, tell them, well, we didn't use any meat to prepare that. You know, it's out of a stock. And then we had pictures from West Africa that we'd taken that were all over the place if you ever came in on a Sunday. Uh -huh. So we it was a it was a beautiful scene. It was just um it just happened. Uh -huh. I can't really say how it happened, but uh it's it's what I wanted to showcase. Mm -hmm. And with Don encouraging me and with him packing us up, taking us for like six weeks through West Africa. And it wasn't like we were going to the a safari. Right. You know, we didn't see any safari things. All we saw was villages and people living uh, everyday lifestyles like we live here in the States. Mm -hmm. um, Cameroon, Nigeria, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau. Um, just um, 15 or 16 cities, states, countries that we visited. Mm -hmm. So you got a good picture of, as he said, how our people were living and how they were eating. We saw mm -hmm. a lot of families living together. There was a great grandmother in the home, a grandmother, children, aunts, uncle, everybody. And then there was a certain time of day where everybody, things just, everybody disappeared. And so where did they all go? And they said, well, it's a um, siesta time. Everybody's going to just close the businesses down. And it's in, for a couple of hours and you just relax. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And that's one of the things that I talked about when I came back, just everybody's in a hurry. Yeah, uh, Where are you going? Nowhere, really. So relaxation. A lot of the things that I'd read about, I was able to put into place. So that's how we got into, that's how I got into the healthy eating, healthy living um, 
portion of what we do. So, you know, I, so I've been talking to you off and on over the years, and I can remember way back you telling me about um, stuff like whether it was you mentioning walking barefoot and uh, you remember the, that. <laughs> the um, what what is it um, what is it called when you have your feet manipulated reflexology reflexology yeah um, that came natural back then just from the lifestyle um to also talking about color and how color brings us into um into not only into our plates but it you know it does something for us on an emotional level with food so all of the things that you've been doing over the years incorporates not just things that you've learned present day but things that you learned back from Mississippi you know, you're right. I and mean, you mentioned about the manipulation of the feet. It didn't have a name. Uh, I'd never heard of reflexology until I'd say maybe 10, 12 years ago when someone says, you know, would you like a reflexology treatment? I said, well, what is that? And they said, well, that's where you get your feet a massage. So I said, oh, so that's what you all call it. But you're right. These are things that... Um, wisdom seekers, grandparents, great grandparents, people from the South were doing. My grandmother um, would have my grandfather put um, Epsom salt in a hot, um, warm water, as hot as she could stand it. Mm -hmm. and it, um, it was almost like a bucket and she'd soak her feet. Mm -hmm. And then he would take like lard and massage her feet. And she would say, oh, I feel like I got some new foots here. You know, I said to myself, oh, wow, that's really something. <laughs> but that was the reflexology. That was hitting the meridians as we know them now. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about that then. Mm -hmm. But uh, I saw that. So years later when I'm traveling and they say reflexology and you pay a 90 to $100, $150 to have your feet massaged, I said, oh, my God. So they've given it a name now. So yeah. you're right. One of the things I saw growing up, and I have a photographic memory, and I was able to, I'm able to go back and and see those things and equate them with some of the things that I do now, the color, mm -hmm. uh, even going as far as the voodoo. You know, my aunt was aunts were heavy into voodoo. Oh. And now they call it, there's a name now that you all have for it. Uh -huh. uh -huh. I don't know what it is, but anyway, you pay. It's not like fortune telling, but uh, sweeping, putting salt on the steps and sweeping them away, sweeping away the evil spirits and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. they, they all come into play. And the color, it meant a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, the color, um, everybody wearing white on the first Sunday for um, communion, you know, the purity. Mm -hmm. the purple, you know, for the royalty. Um, mm -hmm. and, and know, I was doing, I didn't even know why I was doing it, but I guess it was innate. But, you know, it's, it's interesting though, the way that sometimes people can demonize certain things that has a degree of wisdom in it. I mean, um, people will say voodoo or use words that imply a negativity without ever understanding that there is something to it. Um, and so I'm always hesitant about labeling things because whether, you know, whether we talk about it at, in terms of it being voodoo or just um, some kind of ancient wisdom, if it works, it works. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I guess that's, that's how I look at it. Um, yeah, until it's, it's proven not to work is. Um... You're right. We give it a name, and 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 it, it's negative until someone comes along and sees that there's a financial piece that they feel is attached to it. Yes, and yes. then it becomes. You know, it's just like the meditation and mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I remember visiting you once, and you told me about your prayer closet. Yes. Well, growing up in uh, Vicksburg, my aunt had a 
prayer closet. And I remember she'd go in there early in the morning. She had a pillow in there and there was nothing in the closet. And I'd hear her singing and praying mm -hmm. and then the door would be closed. And when she came out, the door was closed. So one day when she wasn't around, I said to myself, boy, if I open that door, I wonder what will happen. Will something, you know, get me? Then I'll, they'll never see me again. <laughs> Should I open that closet door? <laughs> so I got enough nerve to, you know, crack it and open it. And I just expected something just to grab me and then never see me again. But it didn't happen. You know, it was just, um, not just, but it was a closet. You know, there was a pillow on the floor. And I said, hmm, that's, that's mm -hmm. where he goes. So yeah. that goes back to the meditation now and, you mm -hmm. know, the mindfulness and those kind of things that um, was practiced. Um, they're ancient, ancient wisdom, as you say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and sometimes I'm, you know, we have a tendency to, to kind of um, shoot that stuff to the side and I'm, I'm really curious about it. Um, and, and here's something I'm curious about. I used to have a woman every time I went down South, cause I still got family in Mississippi. She would always ask me to bring her back some red dirt because she wanted to eat the red dirt. Do you know what medicinal qualities was in that? I'm, I'm saying it like it, you're like you can't find it anymore, but it's not as readily available as it used to be. You know, I don't know, but I remember my mother saying that when she was um, expecting her first child, that she um, would go and eat the red clay is what she called it. Yeah. She'd mm -hmm. go and she said, take a bowl and take a spoon and dig some out of it and come back and that she would eat it. And mm -hmm. she felt that it gave, it was like minerals and vitamins, mm -hmm. you know, that it nourished your body, mind, and spirit, mm -hmm. that it was good for you. And she, we lived with my paternal grandparents and my paternal grandmother was very much into the spirit and into, um, various esoteric things, you know, like um, praying away evil spirits and voodoo and all of those kind of things. So she said that she encouraged her mm -hmm. to eat, you know, a small amount of clay each day. So apparently mm -hmm. it was, um, I guess like you would take, what, what, what could I? Uh, you, now they sell that clay in the store for like uh nine dollars a, a a thing and they call it clay and you can put it on like a facial mask or something like that but <laughs> it pulls out impurities of, in your skin and things mm -hmm. yeah you're right mm -hmm. um but my mother used to eat uh, red clay and she said in particular when she was expecting her three children you know that she mm -hmm. ate clay with each of us so mm -hmm. And that nice. Was nice. So, okay. So, um, recently, most recently, I went to uh, um the um oh gosh, it just went out of my mind the the wellness summit. Well, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> just that quick, I'm like, oh, where did this thing go? <laughs> Most recently, you had the Wellness Summit um, that was a two-day summit and had some amazing doctors that came in. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came to be? And um, yeah, I, I, I want to hear, because I attended it, and so, I, but I want to hear from your perspective how this all came together. Well, I've always had a zest for knowledge to travel. I've always wanted to know how things were made, how they how they came about, and just seeking uh, to learn what other people knew that I could benefit from, that I could also take in and come back and share with others. So I was forever going around the country, even out of the country, to workshops and to conferences to, when people were presenting um, health summits and speaking about health and wellness. Uh, so through the years, um, and I went to a summit last year in Arizona, and I had been a follower of Dr. T. Colin Campbell of the China study. Mm -hmm. And he's been around for a number of years. So 
it was advertised that he was going to host a wellness retreat in Arizona, the first of its kind by his company. And he's okay. been around 30, 40 years or more. So I decided to go. So mm -hmm. in attending that summit, it was, um, there were so many wonderful speakers, including Dr. Campbell and other speakers from around the country uh, that spoke about health and wellness. And as I was sitting there, I says, all of this, all of this information is so wonderful, but I sort of felt in a way they were preaching to the choir. I mm -hmm. thought most of the people, most of the people there that didn't look like me, there were maybe a couple of hundred people. Mm -hmm. um, they um, looked, um, they were just, they weren't African-American, they weren't Asian-American, they were actually just people of the other persuasion. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if these people I'm sure have some knowledge of um, the things that they're talking about. What if these same people or some of these people or some of the knowledge and some of the things that they talked about, suppose this was presented in my community, in our community of people who don't get a chance to travel or for whatever reasons don't travel around, but still want to live a healthy, productive, long life. What, how could they, how much they could benefit from these speakers? Mm -hmm. So while there, I approached um, Dr. Campbell and told him I'd love to have a summit like this presented in my community. I'm from Cleveland. Mm -hmm. So he said, do you think you could get a couple of hundred people to come? I said, of course. So I came back, sat down with my daughter, Avis and I, and we talked about it. So she says, well, mother, that's what you do. Just do it. What do you want me to do? And she said, she said, just put it together. But she said, don't make a project out of it. You know, just call the people, see what they'll charge, you know, to come in, get a venue, try to get some sponsors. If you don't get some sponsors, we'll just dig in our pockets like we usually do and we'll, and we'll make it happen. Mm -hmm. So that's how that summit came about. Um, I reached out to the people that were there, the wonderful speakers, and told them this was my first summit. Uh, I was not a huge corporation or nonprofit, but uh, we had people that needed the information that they had. And they very graciously agreed to come in to share their knowledge. And that was the formation of that wonderful um, wellness summit that we put on in August. That, it, and it was amazing. So um, yes, the T. Colin Campbell came in via um, Zoom, just like we're doing here now. But that, uh, Dr. Bax, uh, Dexter um, Montgomery, and and uh, Mills, Dr. Dr. Mills. Dr. Mills and Mills. Oh yes. my gosh. Weren't they, they fantastic? Wait, not only were they informative, um, knowledgeable about, you know, what it is that they're promoting, but funny. <laughs> I mean, I found myself even laughing at the things that, I mean, some things you just don't even think about. Right. Um, so I, after attending the summit, I gave up, I, I had gone to the doctor because I had, um, you know, I was, I was going to see an ENT because in the mornings and at night I was so congested and we would just say, oh, you got allergies. Oh, some kind of seasonal allergies. And I'm sneezing all over the place. Like, where did these allergies come from? Right. And apparently your body changes as you get older. And that's the way that they talk about it. Maybe it's something in your environment. But it also dawned on me that I had heard that dairy is dairy products is causes mucus and right. so here I am taking antibiotics trying to get my system together and they're you know prescribing me you know Flonase and antibiotics and the Zyrtec and the, you know all of this stuff that perceivably I would have to take for the rest of my life and I thought to myself that I, after I, I was like, wait a minute, like why if 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 what Dr. Mag, uh, Montgomery and Dr. Mills is telling me is the truth, 
right? Um, the the nurse practitioner that you had there, if um, it, her name, I think it was like Fury or um, yeah, right. Girl Fury. Yeah, if what they were saying was true, I'm sitting up here taking in and ingesting, you know, this stuff that's causing these problems. And all I got to do is maybe cut it out and see if it works. And you know what? <laughs> I took all that medicine. I was just like, I'm not taking this anymore. I can cut all of this out. And oh my God, I got my breath back. It's working for you. Yes. 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 I've lost some weight. I um, but all that congestion is gone. And so when we think about that we might, you know, I, I hear people, we're always talking about the aches and pains and, you know, our joints and all of this stuff, but people never consider that it may be them that's causing their own disease. Well, you're absolutely right. And I know what you're saying is absolutely true because when Don, uh, was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. And it, I wish I had known then what I know now, and I could have helped so much more. But when we stopped eating meat, like I said, for six weeks, if you, know, if you just try it, let's try it. It wasn't like we're gonna sit there and eat a, a steak in front of him and he's gonna have you know beans. So we're the family, we're gonna just change the way we eat. And once we, for those six weeks that, weeks that we had, like a mainly steamed raw, but there was no meat involved at all. And then he went for another, um, he went for about two or three months of not eating meat. Mm -hmm. When he went back for his examination, the doctor said that his congestive heart failure had been reversed. Wow. And that was because of diet, because of uh, eating habits. So I know it can be done. And mm -hmm. like Dr. Mills kept saying that if you, the diabetes is something that you cannot, that you can rid yourself of mm -hmm. through your lifestyle, through the way you eat, the way you live, the way you think. And I know with my husband, it worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, people, people want change, but they don't want to change. You no, know, they don't, trust, they don't see it. They don't hear enough about it uh, from people that, and I know, I believe this plays a major role. People that looks like them, people are from the community, from their community, Dr. Mills and Dr. Montgomery, they look like us. Mm -hmm. And like you said, Dr. Mills was so doggone funny, you know, but what he said was so truthful. You uh -huh. know, he said, every drop of whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't medical terms. He, yeah. They said, how much they said, nary drop. Right, uh, right. Every drop, you know, not a bite, <laughs> not a sip, not a swallow, not <laughs> nothing. Every right? drop, you know, that's absolutely right. That you cannot uh, have it, and, and, and it works. And and you know what? The and and I can attest to that because I will tell you that there are some days when I'll eat something like like um I had pancakes this past weekend. And who thought that putting a piece of butter on your pancake would cause me to wake up sneezing? Because mm -hmm. I was thinking it's just a pat of butter. Yes. But my goodness, it's like, oh, I was sneezing. So I know that it's real. <laughs> it's real. So so you brought these folks in and... Um, but you too have gone away to to retreats just to focus in on cleansing and clearing your body out. Is that right? I have. I go for the last, um, I'd say 10, maybe 12, maybe 15 years, I've gone to the Optimum Health Institute, OHI, in San Diego, California. Mm. I first went for um, two weeks, then I went for three weeks, then I went for a month, then I went for two months. And yes, people say, well, that's expensive. You can afford to do that. Well, I can afford not to have um, heart failure. I can afford not to have diabetes. I would rather invest that money 
in my well-being than to be in a hospital, you know, hooked up to machines and things like that. So I sacrifice. I'm, I call it choices. I make choices. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do to invest in me this year? And I set aside a certain amount of um, resources to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Optimum Health Institute is a place, if it's a retreat. Uh, it's beautiful grounds, but and it's raw. There's nothing cooked there. You have your nice suites. There are no TVs in the room. There are no stoves. Uh, there are no refrigerators. You get your meals. You start out with the meditation. And this is all up to you. You can pay the money and you can lay in your room. Uh, and if you want to take your phone and watch and play games, you can do that. Or you can get up at six o'clock in the morning, drink your wheatgrass, do your walk, do your meditation. It's all on you. There's no one to knock on your door and say, you miss class. You know, mm -hmm. they hope you come. But if you don't come, oh, well. So mm -hmm. I have always invested in me. I just believe that if the more I invest in me, the more I can share and help others. And I, mm -hmm. to me, that's a mission. That's what I love doing. Um, uh, people have different titles. I would say that mine is one of sharing knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'm blessed to be able to travel around the city, around the state, around the globe. And I come back. And I bring that information home and share it. And I mm -hmm. hope that the people that I share it with, they would in turn will share it with others. And that's one way of living forever, that you never die. Yeah. And and so you're, I mean, because cause you are, I mean, you're still not trying to say that you should be any other way. I always tell people, this is what it's supposed to look like. But you don't, you know, a lot of times we see people who just kind of go someplace and sit back and, you know, this having a purpose, this healthy you actually makes a more healthy you. It really does. You know, I could, um, I look at my, I keep my calendar in my phone, but I like the old fashioned, you know, paper calendar. Mm -hmm. And I look at my calendar some days and I laugh to myself. I says, Bell Scott, what the heck are you doing? Where are you going with all these things? Why are you so busy? But the busier I am, the more involved I am, the happier I am. Mm. You know, it, I'm, I'm energized. I feel great. Um, I have something to look forward to every day. Mm -hmm. Yes. I yes. have somewhere to go. I have something to do. I have a purpose. I have a reason for waking up in the morning. Right, right. That's so beautiful. Okay, so now down right near where Veils on the Circle was, you now have an oasis, so to speak. Um, it, it's what is it? What is it called? The um, Veils Purple Oasis. Veils Purple Oasis, and you also have over there a house where you do cooking demos and things like that. Tell us a little bit about what um, what you have going on going forward. Do you have anything that's um, this open and people can sign up for? Well, the um, garden, the garden farm is a couple of acres of land that my dear darling husband, Don, had the vision to buy during the 80s. I didn't even know he was buying this land. And um, he bought acres of land across from where Vells was. At the time, we thought we'd use it for parking, but we didn't need it for parking. So once we sold the business, the land was still there. Um, and one day he said, you know, you could actually build a greenhouse on here, grow your own fruits and vegetables. Well, this was like 1978, 79. And the only greenhouses I ever saw was when we were driving down Highway 61 and you look over, you know, in Tennessee and Mississippi and Arkansas and you saw these houses, these big places that had plastic over them and they were greenhouses. So I said to myself, well, oh, that's a silly idea. I said that to me, to myself, you know, build a greenhouse here. So fast forward, um, we, Cleveland um, started the um gardening movement well they didn't just start it because there was the victory gardens i understand in the 30s and 40s mm. and this garden sort of fell by the wayside 
but we created uh, an oasis there because it's such a beautiful piece of land. And now we have fruit trees, we have apples, pears, peaches, berries. Um, we had chickens, but that was an upkeep and we didn't keep the chickens, but it's a place of relaxation. People can come and learn to grow their own food. They know where their food comes from. And the house we rescued, I kept watching this house across the street from the garden. And one day I went over and found out that the person who had lived there had passed away. So we ended up buying it. So that's our headquarters. That's our kitchen facility. Um, that, and I'm, we call that the Don Scott House. Okay. And that's where we have meetings and that's where we uh, teach canning classes and whatever has to be done. And then there's another like acre of land that comes along with that. So um, we've just come full circle from the Mississippi farming to Cleveland, Ohio in 2023. I look like I'm back to where I started. Uh, and, you know, and it's, and it's so beautiful because, you know, one of the things, so I, I always... I always, in my mind, you're like this glamour, glamour girl, right? And and then to see that you are giving classes on canning is, it just seems like we've got this, it, you know, like, I don't know what I, what I used to think that looked like, because my grandmother always put up preserves, because, you know, there's a pear tree right here. Um, we were always putting up preserves or doing something it's of course um <laughs> i mean you know that that stuff is a bit out of reach now because nobody takes care of the tree even when i used to take care of the tree it was just you know i it just i don't even know how she managed to get all of that stuff other than she had grandsons climb up there and shake the tree we go around and collect the pears the and then we, <laughs> yeah and then we get it done nowadays it just doesn't seem so easy but um but somehow we have taken um this idea of of our food and outsourced it to the point where we want everything instant, everything quick. People don't want to do anything. They don't want um, the, you know, it's almost like people look at it as if it is an inconvenience rather than a beautiful gift that we give to our family. Um, how, how do you, how do you manage? Cause you're, you're, you're busy. How do you manage to still keep that as a, a touch point or something that you come back to? Is it because you've worked it into this healthy you model or is this? I did. I just work it. It actually, um, I live in the moment. I live in the present. I don't try to figure out what's going to happen next month, the month after next. Uh, I just live in the moment. I'm also fortunate to be able to engage with community people, with friends, with people that I've either met through um, the club, through the um, court reporting office, through the, some of them are retired lawyers, judges. Um, some of them were, were, were clients, uh, were customers of ours who started with us when we were, when they were like in their teens and are now in their 60s and 70s have retired and they will come and want something to do. So I says, well, why don't you come down and join me in the canning class? Well, mm -hmm. I don't know how to can, so neither do I, but we can learn together. They've got YouTube now with big TV in there and we can all figure out how to do this. Right. And you tell one somebody and they says, well, I know somebody that cans all the time. So I said, well, let's, why don't we have like a big luncheon at the house? You know, I'll cook, I'll do some food and you guys, and we'll put the TV on and YouTube and we'll learn to can. Oh. And that's how we started our first canning class. Uh -huh. But getting people involved, um, making people feel good about themselves. That was one of the key things with us in the entertainment complex the many years that we were there because everybody was important. Everybody um, was needed. And when mm -hmm. you make people, let people know that they're needed, that they're important, that you depend on them, then that's when 
you're able to get people to um, to rally with you on what you do. Mm. You ne you never ask someone to do something that you're not willing to participate in. Mm -hmm. So um, when I tell them, well, I don't know either, but I know together we can do this. Yeah. And I'll tell somebody, but you work for the city, you work for the water department for 25 years. There's no way in the world that you don't know how to put a water line in. You know, and they said, well, I never thought about that. You know, I said, okay, so come on, you know, well, what if I mess up and we start all over again? We, you know how to cut the water off, right? <laughs> yes, okay, then. You know, if it gets to flooding, we cut the water off. <laughs> but until that time, so you have someone that has this expertise, they get to put it into play and mm -hmm. they get to use it. Or you have someone that you don't get upset because if the canning the first time doesn't go like you thought it should go, it's, oh, well, we will dump this. We've got like 500 pounds of apples across the street. Let's go get some more. Oh, and wow. we'll, be, we'll be able to do it again. So that's how um, you just get people involved. You know, you right. let people know that they are important to you and they are. And um, uh, so that's how you rope us in. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, okay. And, and so you were, I know that you had yoga outside for a while that you were hosting that. Are you doing anything else right now? Are you, what else do you have going on? Well, there's one of my neighbors that uh, is a Tai Chi instructor. Okay. So she is coming to the house and she's doing Tai Chi classes with us. And because of the yoga that your group did, we saw you, you know, we came over to Third Grid Marshall and, you know, you're a yoga instructor and teacher. Mm -hmm. So we have people in the community. There are many people in our community. The clinic asked us to help us help them to introduce yoga to certain portions of our community. Mm -hmm. But there are people in our community like yourselves and like uh, Kimberly and mm -hmm. some of the others that have been involved in yoga for years. So it's nothing new. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of just um, gathering someone in a home. And food is always the catalyst. I would say, well, you know, if you host the uh, event, 10 or 12 women, you know, I'll do the food or I'll make sure that the food is catered and brought in. And it's a time for us to get together. So that's how the yoga came about. The Tai Chi, um, the stretching, anything that uh, movement, walk mm -hmm. together that mm -hmm. you get people involved in um it just uh it it takes on a life of its own that's good that's good so i i'm so excited for um whatever is to come and you have certainly given me some great uh ideas here uh because now i'm sitting here thinking to myself like ooh, and we because you know winter is coming <laughs> And um, and people, we have a tendency to um, to go to you know slow down and to go in, but it would be wonderful to um, figure out how we can even in the midst of that maybe do yoga online and have a cooking demonstration or some kind of cooking afterwards. Of course, put a menu out in advance and say, hey, have all of this stuff on hand and we can all cook together. That would just be so amazing. Well, we can do that between the two of us. There's nothing that we can't do. Yeah. Um, you know, whether there are two or more of us. Yeah. You know, it's just a matter of us doing it. Uh, and the one thing that COVID taught us is that we can reach people around the world from our homes. Yeah. We're on this wonderful Zoom today. And what's to say that we can't have, you know, your yoga instructor, why can't we have a yoga and food um, summit weekly or for a four week session? And you're right, give everybody the recipe ahead of time. So when we start cooking, we can cook in your kitchen. Uh, you have a wonderful garden, wonderful vegetables <laughs> you love to cook. And let's make it happen. Yes, that would let be it so happen. Good. We have to make it happen. <laughs> that would be so amazing. It would be. That would be great. I yeah. love to do that. Yes, and and um and Kimberly is um with my village yoga is um it you know thanks to your wellness summer summit 
She is, um, I do believe, going for some certification in this uh, healthy eating um, spectrum. And so to incorporate all of that together is just, I think, amazing. So I'm looking I, forward to wonderful. what's to come. Yes, yes, yes. It's a pleasure uh, talking about that. And with the Tai Chi, all of it, it goes together. It's all wellness. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, and it's so needed. So needed. It is. It is. Well, thank you, Val. I appreciate you um, giving me some time. And um, and I, you know, I I can't thank you enough for that summit and how it has um, it had it has impacted my life. So I am so appreciate delighted. you. Thank you for participating. Thank you for giving us um, the noon uh, blessing. I call it the noon blessing prayer for the summit. Yeah. That was just awesome. <laughs> cool, cool. All right, well, we'll go. I'm sorry. I look forward to seeing you soon. Yes, yes, yes. I, I will make sure of it. All right, well, take care. Have an amazing weekend. Thank you for this. And um, yeah, I'll see you soon. Take care. All, All right. right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. And thanks, you guys, for being here. Um, I appreciate you. <laughs> thanks for watching. All right. Bye. And let's see. How do... There we go. All right, so I think I stopped the live stream and I think I stopped the veil too. All right, so there we are.